she might be a leader in public relations, the host of two podcasts, an author, and the Los Angeles County Commissioner of Alcohol and Other Drugs. But Tanya McKenzie is above all else, brave. In 2022, she made California history as the first Black woman to run for city councillor in Redondo Beach. The incumbent won, and the journey wasn't easy. But even so, the experience also shed a spotlight on why we need more women and people who reflect our communities in office. Politics is ugly from every angle. Women in particular receive the most of the vitriol from social platforms and their male colleagues simply just for their existence. Yep, we're getting into it. Please welcome my dear friend, Tanya McKenzie. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie, for having me. I love being here and having these talks with you. Definitely enjoy going over some of the more complex issues and everything that you brought up. But yeah, excited to be here with you. So why did you want to run for office? Actually, I didn't. I was asked multiple times because they were looking for solutions, solutions to problems that it seemed no one else had or was willing to bring forward. But we talk about this in leadership all the time, which is being able to identify problems instead of talking in circles about things, which seem to be something that our politicians do these days. And if you avoid identifying the problem, you're never going to be able to provide solutions. And because it's something that I've always been able to do, I'm not gonna say it's not difficult, because you know the work that comes with identifying problems and then venturing into solving them. But it's something that I've never shied away from doing. So when I was asked, I definitely thought about it, went, counseled with my spouse and decided to go ahead. What were your expectations when you ran? I'll be honest. I expected it to get nasty. I expected there to be a lot of pushback because no one of color had ever ventured into this uncomfortable space in the city. I expected there to be some surprises because that comes along with the territory when you are breaking ground on something new, right? I also expected that there would be those that said they would support, that kind of shied away from it. These are all things that I've expected because it's not the first time that I've been the first woman or the first African-American to do something. So I've, I saw it coming. Those are the things I expected. Some of the things I didn't expect was really the level of vitriol, I guess you could say, and the cowardice that showed mm -hmm. up. In all three levels of government in Canada, while you can do some preliminary work in getting teams and planning together, candidates have really a month to actually campaign after the writ is dropped when there is a funding cap. So what is that process like in the U.S. once you decide, once you put your name on the paper, how much time do you have to campaign? And is it the same? Do you once they drop a writ, do you have like a month or is there more lead time? It seems like there's a lot of lead time federally, which we have at the same in all three levels. So federally, you can start a year or two years out. There, there's really no cap. You can announce I'm running for office in five years, right? And you start doing your due diligence, whatever that looks like, whatever you and your team feel like that looks like, what that what needs yeah. to happen. <clears throat> But this was a special election and the incumbent was also a part of the council majority, I'd say the council super majority, which actually put it into place. So they drug it out until the last, very last minute. And they were a part of basically closing the window mm. on this to make it as impossible and intense as as possible. I guess recall elections are virtually impossible in 
California. They've tried to do it a couple of times recently and it didn't go well, even with someone as unpopular as our a district attorney. Like, I don't even think people that voted for him like him anymore. <laughs> but trying to recall him is just very difficult. One, there's a lot of apathy in voting, right? And them council majority understanding that and knowing that and contributing to that, the apathy also, in addition to the voter suppression that has been taking place here and the small window really kind of gave it maybe six weeks. So when an election usually takes about a year, two years, people ramp up. This was six weeks. Yeah. How hard? is it to put that campaign infrastructure together and find an experienced team? Because that really matters when you have a good manager and how to come up with the re financial resources. Usually when you have the, the privilege of having the entire year or six months or whatever it was that you decided when you decided to jump into the race, it can be pretty easy if you've done your work, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've been doing work in a community that you say you want to represent, there are people that will support you because most people want an improved quality of life. I had six weeks before I even started. My question to those that asked me to do this was, are you going to help? Because when you're looking at a recall election, you're looking at people that are complaining. I coin myself as a habitual complainer, but also <laughs> someone that will jump in and do the work to help solve the problems that I'm complaining about, or I won't complain because I'm not going to help fix it. Right. <laughs> that has traditionally been my operation. That's how I work. So I also asked these individuals that were asking me to run, will you help? How will you help? I also decided that this would not be a campaign of finances. Now, American politics is all about finances. Mm -hmm. So this would definitely have to be an election of the people, meaning it's not about the money. It's not about what we can buy. It's about how much we can talk to each other. And when you have a community that's full of apathy, it's important to start having conversations that open people's eyes to issues, solutions, and opportunities for growth and resolution in the community. We have to talk. So everyone that w is asking me to do this, you have to agree to at least get out there with me, talking to the community and letting them know what's going on. So all that being said, it was good. And if we would have had more time, I absolutely believe we could have recalled this guy, hmm. but we didn't, we had six weeks. Meaning I myself am not even home a lot. So if I'm knocking on someone's door over and over again, well, we just missed them. We are just missing them. So we don't know if they're going to vote. If they're not going to vote, who they're going to vote for. Can we have the mm -hmm. conversation? There was a large piece of the puzzle in the timing and in the money. Well, then this guy that was being recalled, he has access to a lot of money. And this was one of those moments where it proved that a lot of our elections can be bought. Yeah. We bought trucks that drove around the city <laughs> with, I'm not, I'm not kidding. In the United States, you get to pull people's records to see who has donated to the, their campaign. His mom donated $20,000 to the campaign. Oh, wow. I mean, money can buy a lot of things elections included big banners throughout the city there's like 10,000 people in our district so why yeah because because I know that federally everybody knows everybody's name then statewide you just pick the familiar name on the ballot and then municipally you probably just oh well that guy sounds familiar and if you don't know the name you just kind of like guess that's how it is here anyway <laughs> <laughs> right. So same. That's really it. It's becomes a matter of brand awareness, yeah. right? And name familiarity in the area that you're in. Even when it comes to like judges and things, you know, you're looking, I've known people to be like, I don't know. I, you know, I did, what did you, Rochambeau. 
to decide who I'm going to vote for because they don't have a clue who these people are, what they represent, how they've judged previous cases that might matter to them. There's a lot of misinformation and lack of information when it comes to voting. And it requires work. You have to research. Yeah. You So that's saying I, I have to be willing as a resident who doesn't spend a lot of time in a community or most of my time is spent with my family or working or commuting. Now I have to stop what I'm doing on a regular basis to research this person and her whole life. And then I need to go research the other person. And then mm -hmm. I need to research all the issues and decide who worked best for me. That's a lot to ask of people yeah. that don't care one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. So the climate of this election you were mentioning got pretty negative. How negative it, did it get? And how did your family deal with it? I am in the South Bay of Los Angeles County. And there has traditionally not been a lot of us, people of color here, especially Black people. There... Some of these cities around where I live are beach cities and they've had sundowning laws. As a matter of fact, I think the one right next door to us might even still have sundowning laws on that. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it means laws on the books that talk about what happens to black people or melanated people if they're caught in a city after the lights, wow. um, street lights come on. Wow. Sundown. When the sun goes down, the lights come on. We need to be out of these cities. There are laws still on the books in some wow. of these cities. So when you look at this election in particular, no woman and no one of color has ever even had the audacity to run hmm. from this district that I'm in. Which is crazy because it is the highest density of minorities. Mm. So being on the ballot was basically me saying, uh, dare me not to. And, and they did. They went all the way in to show me that this was not my place. Mm. This was not what they wanted, those that are the majority and that they would do anything to make sure that I did not uh, take the seat and they did not upseat the incumbent. Yeah, because you ticked two of those boxes. It was bad oh, enough yeah. you were a woman. So we got that. How bad did it get? Things, they started, they started Facebook groups oh, God. Um, with my name. They put out a lot of lies and misinformation. I wouldn't even say embellishments. They were lies. They, I'm from the Bay Area. So for those that might be listening, you know, LA and the Bay Area, yes, we're all in California. But things like Black Panther make you think yeah. of like Oakland, San Francisco, very activist-oriented communities. I'm born and raised in San Jose, California, and now that's the Silicon Valley. So I'm not exactly sure what they thought they were doing, but trying to scare the community that this Black woman is having the audacity to run for office in our white city, this is what it can be. So they had pictures of like people fighting and burning things, Antifa-ish, oh saying, is this what you want for your city? Really? This what you see. This is not leadership. Her Oakland, Black Panther ways. I'm I'm from San Jose. Let me say that again. <laughs> so I've never lived in Oakland, but I don't think there's anything wrong with you if you have. No, in fact, that would make you more badass. <laughs> so fear mongering has become the weapon of choice in politics. Yeah scaring people with other isms she's yeah. not us so this could happen let me see how did that affect my family my husband didn't like it very much my kids didn't care they don't care 
they're so oblivious. I'm sure they did. They just their life is great. <laughs> they don't because we've never raised our children to worry about what other people thought about them mm. or their parents. Yeah. We're very honest with them about everything. So if any of these things were true that these people were saying, then we would have a talk about it. But it was never anything that they were worried about. But that has more to do with who we are as parents, yeah. less about who we are in politics or as adults in the city. But my husband, yeah, he had a problem with it. So he kind of mm, kept a distance, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Many spouses do. <laughs> I see my hit somebody. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I'll put it to you like this. One, a couple of the individuals that are a part of the council majorities in crowd, they're pretty audacious. They, they drive around the city and take pictures of me and a, in one of the other city council women. They take pictures of a lot of people that are not in their little circle and they meme them and they put them in oh, these geez. anonymous Facebook groups on Facebook. They're anonymous. So you can't ever tie it to them or the mayor or the city councilman because they're anonymous, right? Yeah. But their friend uh, roams around the city and takes pictures of us. How do I know? Well, I got a phone call from other county officials that they've received pictures of me and my husband out eating dinner um, of them basically slandering us, slandering me. You're not allowed it's to eat creepy. dinner? <laughs> it's creepy. Because I had I had wine during dinner, girl. And uh, I guess he wanted to position it like I was some kind of alcoholic. And I'm on the county commission. They better so. not see me on Super Bowl day then. <laughs> Super Bowl. Any weekend. I'm grown. I'm grown. I have no record. I have no issues with law enforcement. Matter of fact. You're I on the bloody it. team. So. <laughs> you asked me how nasty it got. Yeah. It got ridiculously nasty. But nothing that I can't come back from. And nothing that anyone that was supporting the campaign would not support the campaign for. It got crazy. It got so crazy that they started turning other people against them yeah. because most people were horrified at some of the things that they did. It started really getting people to think, well, maybe something is wrong with them. Maybe yeah. something is off here. I do believe that their level of fear-mongering and lies, turn the tables. Yeah. We'll see. There was an article, it wound up so bad that we wound up getting an article published in LA Times. And the LA Times is regional for us here. It's not our local news. So it was a big deal when our regional LA Times is a big deal, printed that they had racist emails floating around the mayor and his friend's email accounts. It was wild. It was, it was wild. And I, most people were just like, this is local election. This is how they act federally. We're not even regional. This yeah. is a local town, a small town. But it works I, from the top down, doesn't it? It does. And they hate when I say that. When these things happen, I always point to the mayor. Yeah. Like these are his friends. Every organization, every level, doesn't matter whether it's a public company, corporate company, sports team, federal government, it's the top down. So, top down. Yeah. I wrote a, I had a post one day and they kept saying, you don't want anybody that in our government that thinks like this. And it said, I left the police department and we were doing a anti-hate campaign. And on my, I think it was Twitter. And I said something like, you know, when it comes to racism and hate, the fish rots from the head. <laughs> they were so mad. <laughs> but it does. And that's not my fault if you don't understand that. So what did this experience teach you? It taught me something. It reinforced. It didn't really teach me much. It reinforced the fact that we have the ability to control the 
narrative about in front of a story or we consistently tell our story, there's not too much that someone else can say that is important. It is incredibly important. So at the end of the day, for those people that did decide to go ahead and Google me, they got to see who I really was, not who this other group of people were yeah. saying I was. Yeah. And I've, I've always believed that. I've always believed that it is important for each of us to wrap our arms around our entire story and tell it with the narrative that portrays not just what happened, but how you feel and how it changed you, how it has impacted you, and then what you are putting into the world. So it didn't really teach me much. It definitely showed me that the things that many of us thought was true in this community, oh, it was 120% true. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. You know, because when you allow people the opportunity to hide their truth, they will if they are a coward. And I think I'm in my like anti-cowardice movement right now, just trying to get people to realize being a coward and running from a truth is it's detrimental to you at the end of the day. So I did know, and I was almost challenging these people to, if you're a racist, here's the thing in our country, there are places where you can go right now, like Mississippi, right? And if they don't like black people, they'll just tell you, look, y'all yeah. ain't welcome here. Okay. Y'all ain't welcome here. That's, it's weird. Yeah. They have separate proms still. We get it. Here is like, let's pretend like we like y'all yeah. and then do the things to run you off or make you feel bad or look bad when you're not looking. I think it's very cowardice. If there's something you don't like or something you are uncomfortable with, just say it. And a lot of that comes from your circle. It's not a stretch. You and I both preach this. Diversity in your circle of friends and colleagues matters because you learn about it. You don't have to be the same. I mean, how freaking boring is that? I don't understand. Mind you, we are seeing more women run for office and more people of color. And we need more and more because our communities are looking this way. In Canada, we have a deputy prime minister who is a female. She is unbelievably raked over the coals by the one side. Canadian politics is turning into American politics in the sense that now politicians are needing bodyguards, um, mm. not just the prime minister. Now it's just members of parliament because the deputy prime minister there, there's a video you can look it up on social media or anywhere of her in grand prairie this small city up north in alberta where she's accosted by this redneck dude who you know the jelly jar guy that's trucker convoy type who accosts her on the elevator and it's a dangerous situation she was safe but because obviously she had somebody intercept him, but it was ugly and it just shows what women, regardless, women and women in color, people of color go through when they run for office. But yet we still need to encourage them to do it because we have to make our decisions reflect our communities which is why there's such a pushback now i think on both sides of the border trying to take stuff away because they're so afraid of the alternative i mean what is wrong seriously what is wrong with being kind to people and making everybody feel safe and you know giving them Here's the deal quality of life <laughs> Everyone does not get into politics to help other people. True. Many people get into politics to help themselves. They romanticize these positions. It's almost like a marriage. People romanticize marriage, but they don't want to do the work. They don't actually want to be vulnerable and keep the relationship together. They romanticize it. I will tell you, though, what I did learn, the most important thing to me, because our politics here in America is so contentious, Democrat, Republican. Yeah. I realized that local politics 
it does not matter what party you are in because mm -hmm. it is about everyday issues. You know what matters even more? It, being a parent and not. Oh. Because the issues that matter to you are different than someone that does not have children, right? That's a big, that's a big divide, you know, safety, recreation and opportunity, business development. Those are the things that divide much more than Democrat, Republican in local elections. So yes. that would be the one lesson that really mm, opened my eyes. Your political party has no place in local elections. It's really about those imminent issues that make or break or highly affect your quality of life where you live, work, and play every day. You said you would never run again, but <laughs> we need more women and we need more women of color. So how do we as a community support people's decisions and convince them to run, especially younger, the younger women because, or people of color, because mm -hmm. again, now they want to take away the internet and all this bull crap from the guys that don't even know how to use email are trying to decide what our cybersecurity is going to look like. So how do we support yeah. these people? I think our job as leaders, especially people in communications, is recognizing other leaders in the room and helping them visualize it, right? Mm -hmm. Helping them see themselves in those positions. I definitely love playing the background and helping and leading and pushing, guiding, messaging. I love that stuff. So finding someone that wants to be the voice and make those decisions with the help of others, I really think it's our job to help identify those people, prep them, get them ready, and assist them through the process. It takes a lot of support to get there. It takes a lot of support to be successful there. So being a part of that support team, being a part of the identification process and helping them through is a big deal. Don't ever downplay what that does for our politics and our young women. I'm an LA County commissioner. This is my third commission. So I'm not new to this. I'm not new to serving, but I've always gotten, especially since this recall election is more young ladies saying, hey, this is something I want to do. And I never thought I could do it. I never thought I could be qualified. Girl, I'm all over it. I'm like, oh, yes, you can. And this is what we need to do. And this is where we need to start. I got to-do lists ready. I'm like, find out who your local politicians are, what they're doing, what you like, find your issue, where's your passion. Being able to have those conversations and help them see themselves in a position of power and then being their support for that is like, that's priceless. That's priceless. Thank you so much, Tanya. I'm so happy to have you on the show again. Always happy to be here. Thanks, Deb.